we're honored that Joshua Tablitsky, Dr. Tablitsky is here to bring to life this award-winning book, Prince of the Press, How One Collector Built History's Most Enduring and Remarkable Jewish Library. And in that work, he discovered the towering figure of David Oppenheim, the chief rabbi of Prague in early 18, in the early 18th century, who built an unparalleled collection of Jewish books and manuscripts, all of which have survived and are housed in the Bodleian Library at Oxford University. Uh, later on, I will also speak with Dr. Tablitsky about a project that he's involved with called Footprints, which traces the history and movement of Jewish books since the inception of print. He'll tell us more about that later when we're in our dialogue after his talk. Uh, what we knew about David Oppenheim was through German and Hebrew books, I believe, that were in the marketplace, but no one really paid much attention to this important figure in Jewish history until Dr. Teplitsky came and explicated all we know now about this incredible collector and authority for Jewish intellectual life. So I'm going to ask you now, Dr. Teplitsky, to give us a little bit of background just about how you came to this project. Uh, you could throw in how you got in, in, involved in Jewish studies in a nutshell, but particularly what gave you this inspiration to sit with this important figure who now we, we call him important, but nobody really knew who he was, let's face it. And so with, without any further ado from my side, uh, let me introduce you to the Orzerua community who is so delighted you are here with us tonight. And folks, if you will use the chat to write any questions that come along the way, we'll address those questions later. You can pin Dr. Teplitsky's picture. I'm going to pin in spotlight, but he's also going to do some screen sharing, and you'll be able to see him as he shares slides to come. Dr. Teplitsky. Thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so Rabbi Bolton, would you prefer that I, I do a bit of the talk about how I came to this before we really launch into the meat, or should I save that as a, as a treat for the end? Do it, do, it at, do it at the beginning. Great, great. Okay. Um, so I do thank you for that introduction. It's a lot to live up to, uh, and I hope that I can hope that I can meet the bar that you've uh, set. And before I start, I do just want to thank you for this lovely invitation to be here. I want to thank Mark Ashley. Um, for all of the work in coordinating uh, this event, and to Helene Santo as well, um, for making sure that all of the parts of this event came together, uh, and most of all to you. When Rabbi Bolton and I started talking about this event, we really had high hopes for meeting in person. Um, this is yet another event that uh, is over Zoom, but I I'm delighted to see that people still have the energy to, to come and study together over Zoom, even though we don't get to be together in person. This is a, a really nice close second. Um, okay, and so in, in answer to that question, um, how did I come to this topic? I'll be honest, it started with a failure. Uh, this was a topic that I came to when I was attempting to produce a dissertation in Jewish history. And uh, I was pursuing an entirely different topic and kept on coming up against dead ends, as so often the aspiring scholar or historian does. I'm not at all embarrassed about it, it's, it's the norm. Um, and this project too began with a false start and a dead end. I was in archives in Prague trying to find stories about Jews in the 17th and 18th centuries. And since then I have found many more stories, but I came up against a bit of a block. And so I decided to pivot in a different direction. And what historians do when they're trying to find something to research is they first read all of the other wonderful scholarship that's out there. And as I read around the story of Jews in 17th and 18th century Europe, I kept on seeing the figure of David Oppenheim pop up in the margins of other stories. He was a supporting actor, a supporting character in so many histories of the period. And I wondered what would happen if the camera angle changed, if we moved a supporting figure from the side stage to center stage. And that was the, the first seeds, the earliest germination of this book. With that concept in mind, I started to look at and think about this rabbi and scholar and power broker and collector. And 
I should also confess, my first iteration of this story was to tell a story about a rabbi, was to tell a story about a community. But I realized in time that the thing that excited me most about this man was what excited him, which was his collection of books. Uh, and in no short amount of time, I found my way to Oxford University, where the Bodleian Library has this man's entire collection intact. And that was how I started this project. And he and I and his library spent many years together until, uh, until the book came together. And I'm going to give you just a taste of why I think he's so interesting and illuminating for this period in just a moment. Maybe, maybe I'll launch into that now. Should we, should we roll? Okay, great. I'm just going to set up some slides so I can show you some images and then away we'll go. Let's see. You should be able to see my slides. Zoom tells me so. Rabbi Bolton, can I just get a thumbs up or down? Can you, can you see that? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so just a quick reminder that the chat box is open and active. I'll be monitoring it, although I'll be reserving the time at the end of the talk to respond to questions. I absolutely welcome you to drop your questions in the chat box if something strikes you along the way. I can't promise that I'll address it along the way, but I'll do my best to address it at the end. So I'm going to just call this talk Prince of the Press. That's the title of the book, and, and it's still the most fitting title that I have for this character, David Oppenheim, and we'll see an image of him shortly. The title of the book is a play on words, albeit a subtle one, and we'll see why shortly. But Oppenheim was both named a prince, a Nasi Eretz Israel. He was an important power broker. And the mode of him brokering power was through the press. And I've chosen the word prince because it sounds closely like print or prince as well, and thought it would be a fun play on words together. So this is my talk, Prince of the Press, how one collector built history's most enduring and remarkable Jewish library. Let's see if the slides move. There they go. Let's start here. In January of 2019, which was around exactly the same time that this book became available for purchase, Netflix launched a new television program for audiences who enjoyed previous home improvement style shows about living more efficiently with greater style and less clutter. The show was called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. And its primary goal was to help people get rid of the unnecessary clutter of clothes and tchotchkes and what have you by only keeping items that quote unquote spark joy in their lives. That's all well and good, but the show quickly raised hackles when rumors began to circulate that the titular host had suggested that no home should have more than 30 books. An internet tempest in a teapot erupted across different social media platforms, especially among bibliophiles of all stripes, for whom books are the very epitome of personal joy as they capture the experiences of private reading, shared stories, and just as often the memories of how those books came to be owned in the first place. Now, it turns out that the opinions that were attributed to poor Marie Kondo were somewhat overblown. But the reaction, I think, is far more interesting as they tapped a nerve with lovers of books across the ages and tapped into sentiments that have, have sparked up at, at different moments in history. In fact, I was most um, reminded of an eloquent essay by the German Jewish thinker Walter Benjamin, who wrote an essay called Unpacking My Library that he, that he wrote and published in the year 1931. And in that essay, Benjamin, who, um, who lost his life or took his own life in the process of escaping from the Nazis and failing to uh, receive permission to cross the Pyrenees, Benjamin invited his readers to think about books and unpacking them. And he writes as follows. The disorder of crates that have been wrenched open, the air saturated with the dust of wood, the floor covered with torn paper, he invites his readers to join him amongst piles of volumes so that you may be ready to share with me a bit of the mood. It is certainly not an elegiac mood, but rather one of anticipation, which these books arouse in a genuine collector. Benjamin's talk was about owning books, was about having books, and was about the mood of anticipation that books arouse in a genuine collector. Our talk this evening is about the personal ambition professional reputation, and social networks of a single collector who wished to possess every Jewish book produced up to and during his lifetime. His name was David Oppenheim. 
born in 1664 and dying in 1736, over the course of this lifetime that spans the second half of the 17th century and the first third of the 18th century, David Oppenheim collected 4,500 printed books and a thousand manuscripts, all relating to different aspects of Jewish life and literature. And following Benjamin, what I'd like to do this evening is take the opportunity to share in the mood which these books arouse in a collector, to invoke sentiments familiar to book lovers, but to embed them in particular contexts, practices, social and political meanings distinct to a time before our own. And so on the one hand, we will feel feelings that are familiar about what books invoke in all of us, but we're also going to try to root them in particular stories of time and place and see what we can illuminate about Oppenheim's world by following the trail of books. My aim will be a simple one. I'm going to begin by sketching the means by which such a collection came to be. Then I'll offer a few ways in which it was put to use um, as a repository for consultation, as a reservoir for new publications, and as a source of political power. And then I'll end by following the library as it moved from Oppenheim's care into the Bodleian Library in Oxford, where it stands until this day. A bit of context. Oppenheim's collection was built, not coincidentally, at a moment in which the new science of bibliography had begun to take place across European intellectual circles. The 17th century is particularly interesting for the history of knowledge in that it saw the rise of knowledge collecting in the service of political power. French kings and German nobles, as well as amateur Italian scientists and English gentlemen, produced collections of artifacts and books out of personal curiosity, but also as both tools and symbols of political power. This was fueled by the various cross currents of the era, in part by Renaissance styles of learning emerging from Northern Italy, by Mediterranean exchanges between Christian Europe and the Ottoman Empire, and most importantly, by encounters with the marvels of the new world that had focused renewed attention on collecting materials or things as the basis of knowledge. The discovery of all kinds of new flora and fauna had spurred a drive to collect. That drive to collect was felt particularly acutely in Central Europe, in the German speaking lands of Central Europe, where three decades of conflict in the 17th century had upended the normal routines of life. For 30 years between the years 1618 and 1648, the Thirty Years War had upended alliances and destroyed economies. When the fighting subsided in the year 1648 and was concluded with the Peace of Westphalia, emperors, electors, princes, and bishops undertook to rebuild and refashion their regimes. But the mechanisms of building those regimes, of, of financing those regimes, had disappeared during war. In the absence of those pre-war creditors and fearing competition, many of these high-ranking powers turned to outsiders rather than insiders. And those outsiders were, not surprisingly, Jews. They turned to Jews who were prepared to take economic risk in exchange for opportunity. These risk takers belonged to the wealthiest stratum of German Jewry. Beneath them were numerous paupers and middle class merchants. This is by no means to say that many of Central Europe's Jews were wealthy, but rather there was a tiny stratum, a tiny layer of wealthy German Jews who came in time to be known as court Jews on account of the services they rendered to German noble retinues. Our man David Oppenheim had the good fortune to be born into the most prestigious of these families, which included some of the men that you see on the screen before you right now. They included Samuel Oppenheimer, who was the court Jew to the emperor in Vienna. Uh, they included by relation Samson Wertheimer, who succeeded Oppenheimer as the court Jew in Vienna, and financiers of all kinds of lower rank, but still great significance to commercial life in prominent German towns and cities like Frankfurt am Main, Heidelberg, Worms, Hamburg. In fact, the family of the great Jewish female memoirist of the 17th century, Glickel of Hamon, was related to some of these families. I've used the word only men so far, but we're going to see women enter 
our picture as well soon. In fact, an important way that these families were linked to each other was through the politics of marriage. And those politics of marriage were not possible without both men and women appointed by their families, but still as power players in this network of relations. Now, the wealth and status of this tiny stratum of court Jews enabled Oppenheim's family to afford just about every imaginable educational opportunity for their son's training in Jewish texts and traditions. And it was this training that in turn fueled Oppenheim's collecting activities. We know that he began his studies around the age of four at home in the venerable Jewish city of Worms, or Worms as we would call it in English, with a tutor. And then he engaged in significant travel across the Western Holy Roman Empire under rabbinic masters in, in important centers like Metz, now in France, Friedberg and Landsberg. This was a circuit of educational travel akin to the grand tours that non-Jewish contemporaries of certain high social or even noble standing would take. Oppenheim's activities largely parallel the kind of elite culture that non-Jews of his period would have engaged in as well. Travels of this sort was a means of becoming acquainted with and weaving oneself into the fabric of the world of letters and learning, and Oppenheim's travels did just that. The precise moment of the start of a collection we cannot know. It likely started at home with his parents, it was likely nurtured by his teachers, and it, it likely took material form with handwritten notes by the young man as a student, later aided by gifts from family members and probably sporadic purchases as well. But we know when the collection took off. The collection took off in the year 1682, when the young Oppenheim around the age of 19 or so, uh, actually I'm getting my math wrong, around the age of 18 or so, married, uh, married Genendel, daughter of Leifman Behrens, who was the court Jew of Hanover. And it was this event which occasioned the receipt of books as gifts. Books began to pour into Oppenheim's ownership as gifts on the occasion of his wedding. And in order to impose order upon the books he already owned and the cascade of new acquisitions, he began to create an inventory. Oppenheim took a notebook that he already had used as a student beginning at around the age of 11. This is uh, some of his handwritten notes. It was a book of intercalation of planning calendars or planning the movement of the moon and he repurposed its blank pages into a personal inventory. And here is a page of that inventory that you can see before you. On the 63rd page of this once blank paper volume, he began to catalog his growing library. And it starts with a poem. Oppenheim wrote a little poem. It gives a sense both of his collecting mission and his emerging literary prowess. An enduring component of his writing throughout his life was his delight in illusion. This earliest piece of Oppenheim's writing, or this earliest meaty piece of Oppenheim's writing that I know of, includes an example of this playfulness. The poem reads as follows, with good fortune, the books that I have bought with my wealth to honor my God who formed and acquired me, I have organized them by letter in order, each letter in its vessel and quarter, so that the finder may find with facility at hand any book which is missing from the land, and may God grant me to collect and accrue them that God's Torah in Israel may spread far and wide and to make books to no end and to sustain us and speedily bring the days of the end. Amen, amen, amen. The invocation of the phrase to make books to no end was an, was an allusion to Ecclesiastes or Kohelet 1212. The verse of the Pasug reads as follows, and I'll just read the English. And furthermore, my son be admonished of making many books, there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. But Oppenheim's youthful prose and collector's energy inverted the desperation of this biblical verse and took it instead as instruction for a program of endless acquisition of his own. Rather than the despair of making books to no end, Oppenheim aspired to continue to collect books without end. I just love this notebook. Um, it was this notebook that turned me on to, to writing this entire book. In producing an inventory of his possessions, Oppenheim was sensitive both to the titles of the library, but also to the social networks that enabled their acquisition. In fact, the books are cataloged twice. First, they're organized 
alphabetically. There's a page for each letter of the Aleph Bet. I've circled on one page, uh, Ot Aleph, Ot Bet. Each one has a blank page that he would fill in the names of books beginning with that letter of the alphabet. And then a second time, all of the books are recorded, not in alphabetical order, but rather according to their provenance, where he got them from, paying attention to the source of the acquisition, sometimes the location in which he acquired it, and the price that he paid for each. And so the catalog represents a kind of accumulation of books over time, rather than a single static snapshot, and shows us a collection that, at its last editing, numbered approximately 460 items, which is quite impressive. At the time of its composition, there were only about 2,000 titles existing in print. And Oppenheim, I would say, finished this catalog between 1685 and 1690, already with basically a quarter of the possible books, or a quarter of the possible titles, in his collection. The pages of his catalog reveal contacts with all kinds of different agents and sellers, sometimes book agents in the city, sometimes private provisioners of books. The first entries in the ledger record gifts, demonstrating that they began at his wedding time. But in time, he continued to purchase on his own. We have all kinds of pages telling us about the different people he bought from. For example, in the year 1686, he spent 2.2 Reichsteller on a purchase of 10 volumes from a vendor in his hometown of Worms, which included items that were printed from far away in Riva de Trento, in Mantua, in Venice, and in Prague. Two weeks before Rosh Hashanah, in the autumn of 1686, he purchased almost 100 different books from a man named Zanville of Mannheim, who was a scribe in Worms who doubled as a bookseller. And it should not surprise us that somebody who was a scribe, somebody who recorded books, would also be somebody who would trade in volumes. In the absence of bookstores, scribes would sell books. Sometimes individual authors would double as vendors of their own literary products, taking to the road to peddle the books they had written and published. But these official folks were not the only way that Oppenheim acquired books. In fact, probably one of the most significant ways that he, that he brought books into his collection were by ad hoc sales by the poor to the wealthy. While Oppenheim's family assets uh, provided him with near unlimited resources, it was the financial need of others that significantly drove the collection forward. Oppenheim bought portions of libraries, sometimes even their entirety, from estates of former users, often and most conspicuously from widows, women who had outlived their husbands and had a greater need of liquid cash than the scholarly contents of books that belonged to a world of rabbinic scholarship from which they were formally excluded. Thus, for example, on the 6th of April, 1688, Oppenheim gained 37 volumes for his collection by purchasing them from a widow, uh, a, formerly the wife of Yosef Halevi. In September of 1691, he bought some 19 books from the widow of Avram Stern of Worms for a sum of 20 Rachsteller and 12 and a half Batzen. These small-scale collectors tended to be far more modest in their holdings. Virtually all of their books were printed in the preceding 100 years or so, between the late 16th century and the middle of the 17th century. They were items that were relatively available, didn't require substantial access to our book vendors and collectors, and were thus only a minor expenditure for Oppenheim. In the slide that you see in front of you, I've decided to produce uh, or reproduce from Oppenheim's collection a number of private book inventories. These are photos that I took when I was researching in the Bodleian Library, and they are lists that owners of books have written into the fly leaves of other books, and they have listed the other books that are in my collection. The one in the center is the simplest one. It says, Besiata Dishmaya Rishimat Hasfarim Sheli. This is my list of books, and there's only about three lines there. The first one has a couple of different titles in there, but this person had a very, very modest collection of books. Others that you see above you, uh, this one and that one over there, I'm not sure which way I'm pointing, uh, those have uh, sometimes as many as 17 or 25, but fairly modest collections. And the fact that these volumes with these lists are in Oppenheim's collection tell us that they were mostly gobbled up. The Oppenheim collection is to me particularly fascinating because it tells us the story not only of one fabulously wealthy man, but also we can peer through his collections into the worlds of Jewish book culture of people with much smaller, much more modest, much more ordinary collections than him.
In time, Oppenheim's reach extended beyond his hometown of Worms. In the years following his wedding, he continued to travel, often leaving his wife at home. Travel in person and by proxy allowed Oppenheim to reach ever wider book markets than those in his immediate locale, allowing him to thus extend his reach to encompass the print matter that rolled off of presses across Europe, whether they were in Northern Italy, in Krakow, in Prague, or in the emerging center of Amsterdam. One of the few opportunities to buy books came at the annual trade fairs that were held in Frankfurt and Leipzig. These fairs were often a site of interaction between sellers and readers of Hebrew books, both Christian and Jewish from across the continent. In 1687, Oppenheim dispatched a tutor from Worms to the Frankfurt Fair to survey the new crop of publications. And later when the book trade center of gravity shifted eastward to Leipzig, Oppenheim would occasionally travel there in person from his rabbinic post in Prague, we'll get to that in a moment, where he would jostle among the hundreds of sellers and thousands of buyers both Jewish and non-Jewish alike, who participated in this annual fair. If purchase from printers and purchase at fairs and purchase from widows was one way of getting his hands on books, we could say that still other books entered the collection in a form of what I like to call on-demand production that was not really print at all, but rather through the special commission of scribes to copy manuscripts. This was especially the case in Oppenheim's collection of mystical manuscripts, though it extended into the realm of science as well. One crucial hub for this activity was northern Italy, in Venice and in nearby Mantua, under the leadership of Rabbi Moses Zacuto and Benjamin Cohen. They ran a scriptorium, basically a school of copyists. It was an important agent in the dissemination of Kabbalah, which had been developed or at least one strand of which had been developed most recently in 16th century Tzfat around the Arizal or Isaac Luria and had been transmitted into Europe through this scriptoria like this one in northern Italy. One of the products of this school ascribed by the name of Azriel of Krotoshin was especially important in reproducing texts for Oppenheim. Some 40 of the items in Oppenheim's collection bear traces of Azriel's touch for Israel did more than just copy texts, he also engaged in an act of Jewish cultural translation. What you see on the screen before you, and I know it's a little hard to make out, but what you see on the screen before you is a transliterated text. Israel transliterated texts from a Sephardic, a Mediterranean Jewish hand to an Ashkenazic hand. Um, even in the age before print, there were standard scribal styles and Jews in different parts of Europe, even those that could read Hebrew, could not necessarily with ease read different scribal hands. Oppenheim was one of those Jews. He demonstrated a preference for the Ashkenazic hand over the Sephardic one, and he employed scribes like Azrael to transcribe uh, from, in the exact same language, to transcribe from one hand to another. In fact, Oppenheim in his writings to others and his correspondence to him would often say, it's taking a bit of time for us to copy this for you. We have to move it into the different kind of hand which we know you prefer. Now, I find this to be particularly interesting because it helps us see at once the ties that bind Jews across places, but also shows us the deep rooted belonging of Jews in particular places that make them different from other Jews, even in a time long before our own. If this was the way that the library came together, how was it put to use? Well, the library became increasingly important as Oppenheim matured from a student into a scholar of independent standing. By 1691, he had received a prestigious post at the helm of the Jewish community of Nicholsburg, and then as chief rabbi of the Regional Association of the Jews of Moravia, which is in the eastern portion of Bohemia, or today's Czech Republic. It should be noted that Moravia was not too far from Vienna, the seat of the capital of the Habsburg monarchy, where his uncle at that time was court Jew. And it is without a doubt, in part, his uncle's ties to the emperor that leveraged Oppenheim at a very young age into positions of prestige, although he couldn't have done this without also serious scholarly training as well. 
If he had achieved this by 1691, by 1703, he was awarded the chief rabbinate of the city of Prague, or to put it more precisely, half of the chief rabbinate of the city of Prague, which at that time was the largest urban community of Jews in all of Christian Europe. This new role entailed administration of Jewish educational institutions, but also to preside over local and regional networks of Jewish courts of law and involvement in drafting communal legislation, each of which were enhanced by his personal library. As a Rosh Yeshiva, as a head of a Yeshiva, an academy of Jewish higher learning, Oppenheim used his library as a font from which to draw materials for his regular lectures to the assembled young men and only young men at that. He prepared lectures for oral delivery and written dissemination by drawing on his personal collection, which included 11 editions of the Talmud in some 16 complete sets, numbering 248 volumes. He owned numerous copies of the various tractates that had been published individually, not even as portions of print runs of entire sets. His library further encompassed many of the writings by commentators and super commentators on the text of the Bible, expansive rabbinic commentaries on the Talmud produced in the Middle Ages, and the growing print library of legal compendia, codes of law, and responsa. The Jewish religious and civil law was governed by a negotiation between textual traditions and the exigencies of daily life. Jews in the early modern period, as we know very well, had no sovereign state, but they did possess a sophisticated variety of political institutions to govern their daily, individual, and collective lives. Most Jewish communities constituted themselves with a leadership of elected Jewish officials, more often a permanent oligarchy that served as intermediaries between Jews and the government, but also administered a whole range of social welfare. Rabbis played a role in this process as they were often consulted for legal opinions in matters that were not strictly speaking either religious or ritual, but they were often subordinated to elected lay leadership. Still, rabbis played an important role, and Oppenheim played one that was even more important. Thus, for example, the statutes of the regional association of the Jews of uh, thus, for example, the statutes of the regional association of the Jews of Moravia, which you can see on the screen before you, which were primarily directed towards guiding the administrative policy of the non-rabbinic elected leadership in matters of taxation, funding schools, charity, um, paying for midwives. Uh, bringing etrogim from Italy to the communities of Moravia. I'm happy to talk about each and every one of those individual aspects later if people would like. But texts like this recognized a role for chief rabbis like Oppenheim as a kind of appellate court who could interpret earlier laws. These laws understood full well to be human made by consensus rather than divine and still Oppenheim as rabbi was expected to play a role in their interpretation. In fact, Oppenheim was different than other rabbis in that he played a particularly extraordinary role. In the year he was entrusted as keeper of the books of these statutes, a function that had never before been entrusted to a chief rabbi. It was understood that a man like Oppenheim who knew how to take care of books was the safest place for precious handwritten what we might call the constitutional literature of the Jews of Moravia were best kept in his hands, we might call him the librarian of Congress or something of that nature. And he was the best kind of librarian and archivist to hold on to these precious material artifacts. In fact, Jews from other locations would also reach out to Oppenheim and his resourcefulness when it came to writing their statutes as well. In 1706, the Jewish communal elders of Hildesheim took upon themselves the task of rewriting their civil statutes, or actually to be more clear, they asked Oppenheim to do it for them. And in response to their request, he drafted 21 rules by which the community should administer itself, including how to keep their documents safe, saying as follows, quote, the community will have a special box with two keys and within it they shall place all of their ledgers and contracts and all of their items that relate to the kahal. It sounds like such a mundane matter, but controlling documents is perhaps one of the most powerful things that governments do. Uh, records, documents, um, I'm sure many of us have begun to receive our W-2s and all kinds of other tax filing documents. We live in worlds of paper. 
and issuing that paper, managing that paper, monitoring that paper is a chief role of government. And Oppenheim knew how to govern in such a way. His library soon became a wellspring of information, not only for his own uses, not only for the civil life of Jews, but also for rabbinic contemporaries. Rabbis from across Europe would write to him and their writings to this very day feature kind of scattered asides where they mention Oppenheim and his library as the source of a rare text. We're very fortunate to have preserved tens if not hundreds of letters that Oppenheim received. Uh, the challenge is I have very few of the letters he wrote back, but I'm actually, if I had to choose between the two, I'm happier with this one. I have tens of people writing to him and their opinions of him rather than just the way this man wrote about others alone. I get to see other people's perspectives about him as they would write to him, request materials from him, flatter him as follows. One relative, for example, wrote, quote, I found and I saw in the responsa of a Rashba in manuscript in the noble collection of my in-law, the great David Oppenheim. In 1709, Oppenheim received a request from a man in Halberstadt who was trying to write his own commentary on part of the Talmud. And he requested to visit Oppenheim's collection in order to read different manuscript editions of the Talmud that had survived from the Middle Ages in the hopes of discovering textual variants that would allow him to resolve different contradictions. When Jews want to talk about, there's that recording back again. When Jews want to talk about libraries, they often have to use loan words from other languages like bibliothèque. Um, and, and examples like this abound and I'd be happy to talk about more of them. But I think a crucial distinction needs to be made here. As much as Oppenheim granted other people access to aspects of his collection, he always maintained an only semi-permeable membrane always a privileged position with respect to the knowledge that he had in his care. In the course of, length, in the course of lengthy rabbinic discussions, um, as, as he was writing his legal opinions, he would often pepper his writings with phrases like this, quote, I shall not withhold that which I found in my house of treasures in books which were written, but have not yet been published. And in doing so, he would flag for his readers that he held unique material to which only he was privileged and the absence of which in the eyes of others made their rulings somewhat less than complete. Thus, when a controversy erupted in Hamburg that engulfed the rabbis of Central Europe in assessing whether a chicken found without a heart could be considered kosher and whether such a chicken could ever have existed at all, Oppenheim rendered his decision by referring obliquely to finding, quote, an ancient compendium in manuscript, which aided him in making his rulings in a way that others could not. He thus cultivated an image of almost complete identity between himself and his library. This is a, a, a title page to a, a manuscript um, where Oppenheim is rendered uh, as sitting and reading his books. It's not the best exact artistic rendition, but it's a kind of tribute to him as a man who loves books. And often in his personal correspondence, he would, for, he would refer to himself as a man whose greatest delight is with books. In, in his parlance, he would call himself Ish Nachat Yenachet Bisfarim, um, a variation of the term Nachas. He would get Nachas from his books, often conveying his personal affection for his collection. Contemporaries recognized that Oppenheim was both an influential leader and a connoisseur of a personal type, and they would often attempt to curry his favor by sending him books. His aid was so sought after that books arrived in his collection from great distances, especially from the Eastern Mediterranean, from the land of Israel. Emissaries from Jerusalem would repeatedly send manuscripts to Oppenheim. They did this not just because they knew he liked books, but because he was a man who was connected to wealthy Jews 
who might serve as patrons and philanthropists for this struggling community. And so they used books as a kind of currency, sending them to Oppenheim in exchange for something of a quid pro quo of financial support. In fact, they were in such need of Oppenheim as a broker, as a middleman, that in the year 1698, Oppenheim was invited to relocate to be the chief rabbi of Jerusalem. It was an invitation he declined, or at least he declined the position, but opted instead to retain the title. And for, the, for years thereafter, referred to himself not quite as rabbi of Jerusalem, but rather as prince of the land of Israel, Nasi Eretz Israel, for several decades to follow. What you see before you is a broadside, another word for a poster, a one-sided large poster image uh, in which Oppenheim had printed the letter that he wrote to the Jews of Jerusalem, in which he declined the invitation, but held on to the title. And, and what I see here is, is Oppenheim being a kind of media man. He didn't move to Jerusalem, which means people wouldn't have known that he was awarded the title. And so instead, in lieu of his own presence in Jerusalem, he had printed paper that would spread the news. Broadsides like this one were actually important vehicles for info sharing across the European map. And in many of the pages, or many actually of the bindings of the books that are still in the collection, we can find broadsides like these pasted into them. They give us access to a kind of hidden archive of printed matter that we might not refer to as books in their classical sense, but teach us something about the print culture of early modern Jewish life. Here on the screen are some others that are pasted into Oppenheim's books. These ones are designed for display. They're basically um, printed for home decor. To my eye, they're not necessarily the most alluring. Notice how text heavy they are rather than image heavy, but they are designed to be, um, to be pinned up in different places in the house, some on the door, a vision for decoration. Um, others have larger maps of Eretz Israel, like this one. Others are designed to share news. And this one, a particularly illustrative broadside, which I think was intended to be displayed in a school, looks like it is a Kabbalistic chart. It's actually far more prosaic than that. It's a grammar chart. It's convoluted circles, rectangles, lines linking them all together are designed to teach people Hebrew grammar. And the treasures of the Oppenheim collection preserve some of these for us and permit us an invaluable means of recreating different aspects of Jewish culture that often evade our view. In fact, it's precisely this. It's Oppenheim's, Oppenheim's proclivity for buying books that many other elite learned collectors of his period would have deemed too cheap or too proletarian make his collection stand out. He didn't just collect the high rabbinic culture of his period. He collected everything that rolled off of a press often cheap ones at that. He bought small books in smaller sizes that were produced inexpensively and that were usually directed towards a mass market. For our purposes, that primarily means books in Yiddish. The Oppenheim collection is a rare reservoir for Yiddish books that were printed in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries that exist in unique copies. Scholars of Yiddish from around the world travel to the Bodleian Library to consult single copies. They must have been printed in print runs of at least 300, but only a single copy has survived and it's in the Oppenheim collection today. Some of them were fictional tales for entertainment. Others were poems that reported on recent events, such as one that talked about a fire in Hamburg Altona, or one that talked about an outbreak of plague in Prague. Some of them were prayers, such as the one you see on the screen before you, a trine, which is designed specifically for women. Oppenheim owned some 28 copies of women's trines that covered 25 separate editions and imprints. Others of this nature were directed towards young men, such as a work called Yud Shir Stam, which retold the biblical tale of the binding of Isaac. And so between the poles of the exorbitantly expensive and the negligibly cheap were an array of medium-sized volumes. Prayer books, Bibles, Oppenheim owned 63 copies of the Passover Haggadah in 45 different editions 
This is one of my favorite ones, the Sulzbach 1711 Haggadah, which Oppenheim had colored in for him and particularly well illustrated. I also particularly like pages like this. I've got a couple of others to show you. Um, this frontispiece was quite a common one with Moses and Aaron on the side, uh, designed not by a Jew, but, but quite often appearing in Jewish printings. Um, and in one version of them, sometimes the, the circle here is empty. Sometimes different figures appear there. In all of Oppenheim's manuscripts, King David appears in the circle at the top. And I think of it as a kind of ex libris of Oppenheim's. Uh, for David was his namesake, David HaMelech, King David was his namesake, and David Oppenheim adopted that kind of persona, especially as he relocated to the city of Prague. Now again, Oppenheim moved to the city of Prague in 1703, and that move was decisive, not just for his career, but for his library in a somewhat surprising way. Prague was a major center of focus for the then reigning Habsburg monarchy in its campaign to re-Catholicize its lands after centuries of wars of religion. Jews were not the, the primary target of this effort. It was Lutherans, it was Protestants of different sorts that were the primary target, but all non-Catholic books came under the special scrutiny of the archbishopric of the city, which was held by members of the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. This meant that the city of Prague was one under heightened surveillance. And it's here that we're going to get into some of the topic of interactions with non-Jews, as I see that some have asked on the side. When Oppenheim assumed his new office in Prague in 1703, he was aware of the tight culture of surveillance on non-Catholic books in the city. And he presently feared for the safety of his library and therefore decided not to bring it with him to Prague. Instead, he secured a home for his books at the estate of his father-in-law, who was the court Jew to the Elector of Hanover. And an elector is a kind of obscure position, important in early modern German politics, but now gone. But the name of this particular princeling or elector in Hanover is a pretty important one. The elector of Hanover was named George. Um, and Oppenheim's father-in-law had secured a royal title for George, which made him eventually eligible in time to be a member of the Hanoverian dynasty that would ultimately become kings of England. Uh, he was a, an ancestor of George III and all the other Georges to follow. Um, this Oppenheim family was deeply, deeply tied into some of the most powerful, noble, and royal houses of the period. And it was this George of Hanover that granted a privilege for Oppenheim to have a home in Hanover where he relocated his entire collection. You would think that this would be something of a sad thing, but in my opinion, it actually made the library far more professional. As Oppenheim separated from his collection, the collection needed a much better form of professional organization. I'm sure many of us have had the experience of having a disorganized pile of papers where we know exactly where everything is, but if anybody else were to waltz into our offices or, or look at our desks, nobody would know how to figure it out. And Oppenheim's library was not dissimilar. When the library was moved away from his care and away from where he was chief rabbi, it needed a librarian. And when it was moved to Hanover, it received exactly that. His son served as one. He had actually a number of different staff members. And here really is where non-Jews enter into the equation as well. One of the few contemporary impressions that we have of the library as a whole comes from a visitor to Hanover. And it comes from a Christian diplomat who paid a visit to the library in the winter of 1713. The visitor was named Johann Andersen. He held a doctorate in law from the University of Leiden and had recently served at a peace treaty that had brought an end to the war of Spanish succession. That peace treaty was convened in Utrecht in the Netherlands and on his way home from there, he traveled to Hanover. Anderson visited Oppenheim's collection there, and he acknowledged that, quote, although I myself cannot read the Hebrew language, the caretaker of the library showed me all kinds of items. The owner himself was not present, but rather absent in Prague, that's our Oppenheim, but his son-in-law, I think he really means son, showed me all civility, 
and the old cantor of the synagogue showed me the most noteworthy of books, which I inquired after. You know, there are all of these different Jewish figures who are, who are inviting Christians to, to see the treasures of this collection. Among the printed volumes, one can find an astounding quantity of Bibles, all of the editions of the Talmud, and prayers printed from entirely unknown locations in small villages, among other books. He showed me an item of the Bible printed on large parchment consisting of the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, probably in a very ancient age, and a similar one in small format written very neatly for a wealthy Jew a few years ago with the Masorah in the margin and on every side in special fashion, borders, lines, and leaves, animals, and fish, some of them microscopic. Anderson was alert to the material beauty of these objects, even though he couldn't read the words himself. And these two were a testament to Oppenheim's collecting activities. Raised in the world for the court Jews, we saw their fine portraiture about half an hour, if not longer ago, raised in a world of people who understood the power of aesthetics. Oppenheim too understood the aesthetics, the materiality of the book. He was a patron of newly printed words, and he, he would demand special copies of books for him. He had books that were printed on special colored paper, oranges, grays, blues, um, often the material or cardboard that would be used for the binding of books, that precious outside of books, would, would make up the interior of his books, a demonstration of his great and fabulous wealth. He also subvented, that is to say, paid for the cost of entire print runs of other books. And he also, every once in a while, released rare unprinted material into circulation. Perhaps most noteworthy among these projects was Oppenheim's participation in printing a new edition of the Bible with commentary in Berlin in the year 1705. This printing of the Chamishachum Shei Torah, of the Torah before the Bible, just the Chamishachum Shei Torah, the five books of Moses or Pentateuch, is remarkable for one particular reason to my mind. First, actually, a couple of reasons. To answer also the Christian question, it was printed in a Christian printing house. In fact, many books over the course of the early modern period were printed as a collaboration between Jews and Christians. And we would do well not to see them as working at odds with each other, not necessarily to love each other, but there's a space between love and hate, and that's a, some kind of working together. This particular edition from the year 1705 is to my mind particularly important because it features for the very first time the commentary of the medieval Rabbi Samuel ben Meir of Troyes, or the Rashbam. For centuries, scholars had been aware of the existence of Rashbam's commentary, noted for its attention to the plain meaning of the biblical text, even when that meaning departed from conventional Talmudic understandings, but no Chumash printed before the year 1705 had featured a printing of this commentary. And so when a new edition of the rabbinic Bible was planned by a Christian Hebraist and court preacher in Berlin by the name of Daniel Ernest Jablonski, a chain of contacts led to Oppenheim. Oppenheim offered a lengthy preface to the first volume of this edition. There he explained the providential circumstances that had unearthed this long thought lost text. He says that in his youth in Worms, before the city had been sacked by French forces in 1689, he was told of a trove of discarded books and manuscripts in a synagogue attic. And although the pages were moldy and some eaten away by vermin, Oppenheim thanked God for the fact that they had been abandoned to an attic rather than buried in the ground. We might call this an Ashkenazic Geniza. It's dwarfed by the Cairo Geniza, but still an interesting one all the same. Oppenheim tells us that there in the attic, he discovered the manuscript and he held onto it for nearly 20 years, claiming that he was loath to print it until prevailed upon by colleagues. Until finally he allowed it to be printed and it appeared in the year 1705. As an amazing media man, in some of the printings of this Chumash, there is a second title page. So on this slide, you see the first title page. It says at the top, Chamisha Chum Shei Torah. And if you flip in a few more pages, there is a new title page that says on it, this is the book of the Rashbam, even though it's so much more. A special title page was produced to advertise the uniqueness of this first time copy. And in smaller letters, it says, which has been found in the marvelous collection of our great unparalleled leader, 
David Oppenheim of Prague. Now's a good time to move to the next question in the chat box, which is where are these books today and how is it possible to recreate their history by consulting them directly? Now, the answer to that question lies partly in the twists of fate and partly in shifts in Jewish culture and politics. Oppenheim died in the year 1736, having lived actually a relatively long life of 72 years. He was succeeded by his son, Joseph, who was the immediate heir of the collection. But Joseph Oppenheim survived his father by a mere three years. And thus, within a very short time, the library was orphaned both of its original creator and its inherited caretaker. The library's ownership was then passed to Joseph's daughter, Genendel, and her husband, who lived in Hildesheim, not too far from Hanover. As was quite common for families of fortune in risky creditor positions like the Oppenheims, their fortune rose and waned within a few years. And soon Genendel, the owner of the library, found herself in some fairly dire financial straits. And she tried to use the library as collateral against major loans. In order to assess the value of this library, Genendel reached out to some of the greatest experts of her age and solicited the opinion of two scholars. One named Johann David Michaelis, who was a professor of Oriental Studies at the University of Göttingen. The other visitor to the library who appraised its worth was a man named Moses Mendelssohn father of Jewish enlightenment. Mendelssohn himself visited the Oppenheim collection and appraised it. He wasn't sure that he could totally name the exact price, but he wrote as follows, that quote, a price of 50 or 60,000 Reichsteller would certainly not be too expensive to pay. His colleague Michaelis was more hesitant to hazard any sort of preliminary guess, but he did too confirm that quote, the value of the library is exceedingly great. And he further clarified the worth that the, that this was worth, or had worth rather, quote, not only for Jews, but also for Christians, not merely for both in Germany, but rather in Europe. And I see, and I'm going to, I'd love to address with you soon the question about Jewish and non-Jewish literatures. It's interesting to me that non-Jews recognized, so in addition to the question of what kind of non-Jewish literature was in the collection, I want to also highlight that non-Jews recognized the value of the Jewish literature for European civilization as a whole. Before a buyer could be found, however, a relative of Ganendels appeared to have remitted her outstanding debts in exchange for the collection. And so the library stayed in the family, although it moved to Hamburg, the port city. The late 18th century relocation of this library was roughly contemporaneous, though, with events that dramatically reshaped Jewish life in Europe. In those heady years, Jews experienced the first extensions of civil and political emancipation, and soon the French Revolution. The rights of citizenship were extended to Jews in 1791 and 1792 in France, and when Napoleon exported the French Revolution at the point of a bayonet to similar parts of the Netherlands, Italy, parts of Germany as well. Some Jews envisioned the library therefore playing a new role. Um, when a republic was established in Westphalia by Napoleon's armies and uh, the emperor's brother Jerome was installed as its ruler, a consistory was established there to handle Jewish affairs. And the president of this consistory lobbied to purchase the library, which would then be used to quote unquote, regenerate Jewish culture in a new key to be used as an agent, not just of tradition, but of modernization for Jews as they deepened their understanding of the past in the service of present and future. But efforts at enlisting the library into services of such state-sponsored reforms ultimately foundered. Instead, the library was once again orphaned and was prepared for public auction. And you can see in front of you different catalogs that were produced about the library. Every 30 years or so, the library was mooted for auction. And these different catalogs show us the organization of the library in preparation for this event. This one in particular, and that's the, the item that you see over here, this is the last auction catalog that was produced in the year 1826, it was produced in many catalogs, lots of these still exist because they were dispersed to potential buyers. The auction itself was scheduled for June of 1827, but by late 1826, the Reverend Dr. Alexander Nichol, who was the Regis Professor of Hebrew 
and a former librarian at the Bodleian Library had empowered an agent in Hamburg to place a bid on its acquisition. For months, the different parties negotiated, but in May of 1828, a final sum of 2,080 pounds was assigned to the collection. It's worth about 9,000 Reichsteller, which is a far cry from Mendelssohn's 50 or 60,000. And the library's contents were packed into 34 crates a year later in May of 1829 and arrived in Oxford several weeks later that summer. Over the course of the 19th and 20th century, scholars expressed great disappointment that Oxford was the home of this collection. In his 1845 masterpiece, Zur Geschichte und Literatur, on history and literature, the great Leopold Zuntz, one of the first scholars of, or scientific scholars of Jewish life, described the collection as, quote, belonging to the few memorials that Jews established and Christians preserved. As late as 1930, a scholar complained that, quote, it cannot, with best possible goodwill, be considered lucky for the library or for Jewish learning that fate has decreed Oxford to be the home of the Oppenheimer Library, end quote. Yet much as the twists of fate has, had brought this collection into existence, strange twists of fate preserved it from the horrors that would befall Jews and their rich cultural heritage on the European continent only a few years later. And today, the Oppenheim Library attracts the attention of scholars of Judaica from around the world, who come to marvel at its treasures and use its contents to reconstruct the lives and literatures of Jews in ages past. All you need is a library card and you too, well, and a ticket and a negative COVID test, and you too can consult the books in this Oppenheim collection. Perhaps I'll end with another quote from Walter Benjamin. Benjamin wrote, to renew the old world, that is the collector's deepest desire. And if we pace through the stacks or carefully thumb through the folios of the books in this collection, a world of encounters of the old world open up before the eyes of the beholder. For some, these avail themselves to the reconstruction of a school of scientific or mystical or, or legal thought or different intellectual phenomena. For others, it tells us about the social life of books in motion. For still others, about rules and behaviors. Oppenheim's collection as a whole taken, shows the individual fates of copies of books and the wider social, intellectual, professional ties they reflect. In the aggregate, we can see both the trees and the forest towards an understanding of a man who animated a collection in the service of politics and scholarship, as well as the wider backdrop of women and men, Jews and Christians, artists and scribes, rich and poor, local and global, that converged in the making of this magnificent enduring library, a monument not just to a man, but to worlds of social and cultural interaction in early modern Europe. And with that, I thank you. Should we take some questions? I'm looking for Abbe Bolton. Let's see, Rabbi Bolton, are you there? Can you stop your screen share so that we can all sure. be in a gallery of uh, seeing one another? Sure. Great. And I'm going to put my view on gallery, though you can still pin Dr. Teplitsky. Uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of dialogue before we take other questions. And uh, the first one I'll shoot back at you, Dr. Teplitsky, is this. It seemed like uh, Oppenheim really understood that he could become the Merkaz Hamachaba, the central address for Jewish thought, intellectual history, uh, legal opinion, and at that point, what was becoming a history of the book, the, of the people of the book. People who talk about book collectors during this time period refer also to some who are in Amsterdam. And the world of book collecting, printing is just off, you know, and gets started. And then book collecting starts and we have certain libraries that are being amassed by both Christian collectors who understand the importance of Jewish books and Jews themselves in Amsterdam, right? So was this a play politically to move the center of Jewish book collecting 
And does that really play a role in this? And, and have you addressed that in, in your history making here? You're on mute, so I, I, we need to come off mute. Thanks. Uh, I said all the most important things on mute just now. There's no way we can do that. <laughs> um, it's, it's a really interesting question. I'm glad you're asking it. Amsterdam indeed was an emerging center, although I don't think anybody in Prague would say that Amsterdam yet rivaled it. The people that might say that Amsterdam rivaled it, what we might do is actually distinguish between Ashkenazic and Sephardic communities. Um, Amsterdam was a beacon of light for the Sephardic worlds. It had paled in comparison. It was the younger sibling to the city of Venice, but by the early 18th century, it was the hub of Sephardic, of the Sephardic world. Uh, the Jews of Livorno and Venice would write to it. Jews of North Africa would write to it. The Jews of Curaçao uh, and the New World um, and New Amsterdam would write to Amster uh, New Amsterdam would write to Old Amsterdam as well. But for the Ashkenazic world, Prague was really a major, major center. And so I'm not even sure that the two were on each other's radars. Much as we saw the different forms of handwriting, Ashkenazim and Sephardim, although they belonged to a, a single common Judaism, often in, in daily practice, and by that I don't just mean custom, but I mean the networks that they moved in, the way they dispersed and dispensed with charity, were really quite separate worlds. Not to say that they never connected, but in normal times, when times were not moments of crisis, they seldom crossed paths with each other. In Amsterdam, there were separate Ashkenazic and Sephardic communities, and we know that the Sephardim of Amsterdam really looked down on the Ashkenazim of Amsterdam. Um, they would tell us with good reason. Uh, that's something that I don't, I don't want to enter into judge and jury on, um, but right. they were really quite different worlds. Um, okay. And so I think that, that in the networks that Oppenheim participated in, I think he really was an unparalleled kind of authority. That, that's, that, I, I want to play off that what you just said now that he's an unparalleled kind of authority and I want to also apply that to his character as rabbi chief rabbi of Prague and Nasi Eretz Yisrael the self-acclaimed prince of Israel I, and I was I was thinking about this in the presentation of the kinds of books he collected and that became a, you see, parts of his collection you know, some rabbis very shortly after his reign would become very negative towards, let's say, folk Yiddish culture. And they wouldn't have ever allowed for the collection of fiction, even in the lingua franca, even in the spoken language of the Jewish people at the time. They might not have wanted to touch any of that. He might have just wanted to create the authoritative group of texts, both by way of published books and manuscripts that you don't have your hands on yet, so you need to come to me to get the latest opinion on that halachic inquiry that you're that you're really uh, looking for. But it sounds like he went and understood that the Jewish people, vis-a-vis -vis people of the book, was a lot more than the sacred text of either Talmudic or halachic kind of uh, of of bookmaking. And so what more do we see in his possession that proves that he was that kind of cosmopolitan? And do we think of Prague as that kind of a cosmopolitan place that influences him or is he unique? Thanks, thanks. And, I, and we might even tie some of the questions. I think somebody up above asked the question about, does he have secular, did he collect any secular literature? I see the question came in, I think from Mark Hoffman, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and you know, I think you're both really onto something, although I want to answer the question in a typical Jewish fashion which, with a question, which is to say, what is secular literature? I think in, in an age before our own, it's a little bit difficult to qualify something as secular literature. One of the, one of the primary um, criteria uh, or the primary criterion for Oppenheim's collection was that books were in a Jewish language. I think that was a, the primary criterion. He has books in Hebrew, in Yiddish, in Judeo-Arabic, in Judeo-Spanish, but very few that are not in Jewish characters. He has very few Latin books, for example, almost none. Um, he has very few French or German works. Um, the, the small traces, we, I, I think that he had passable German, a kind of hybrid of Yiddish and German. We've got a collection of documents 
that he had copied for him um, by one of his official scribes that are about his correspondence with the state. And so he knew to move between worlds and also to have passable German, but that kind of literature or those languages of literature weren't interesting to him, which is not to say that he was only interested in what we might strictly identify as religious texts. He collected um, medieval mathematical literature produced by Jews. He, pro he collected scientific literature, even those that were from the Arabic traditions, but once they were Judaized, into Judeo-Arabic or into Hebrew, then they found their way into his collection. So I think he had an expansive, a capacious, a broad view of what makes something Jewish. And I think that primarily had to do with orthography, with the characters in which it was expressed. And once that hurdle was cleared, the books made it into the collection. The legends of King Arthur in German, not in the collection. The Yiddish translations of König Arthur's Hof of King Arthur's court are in the collection. Um, stories of merry wives in Hamburg are in the collection, provided that they are in Yiddish. Drei Weiber von Hamburg make it into the collection, but their German counterpart does not. In fact, scholars have done fabulous work in using some of these different copies to locate, to identify how these books came into being before Oppenheim. Um, and to show us what the paths of communication were between Jews and Christians. Sometimes there are great, he's got a couple of song books, uh, actually a number of song books. Um, Jews didn't have musical notation in, uh, or distinctly Jewish musical notation prior to the 19th century. We, we find it very, very infrequently, but that doesn't mean the Jews didn't have music. Uh, there were famous Chazanim cantors who would travel back and forth across Europe, putting on concerts. Um, and instead, the way that Jews would usually note their melodies is in their printed songbooks, they would say, this is to be sung to, the, sung to the tune of, and they would give another tune. And often those tunes were familiar ones that were not distinctly Jewish, but had been picked up from Christian circles as well. Um, so, which is to say there are all kinds of circulations of customs of themes that move between these groups. And the language barrier is actually not that difficult a one to cross. And that's how we see some of this movement there. I would say that some of the, the um, trends that you note in a later period, the uh, resistance to folk culture, um, which we see on the one hand by the masculine, who are not necessarily traditionalists, but who want to purify Jews and Judaism of their superstitions. And on the other hand, movements by traditionalist circles to produce a kind of backlash. Both of those, we might say, are distinctly modern phenomena, that there's an eclecticism in the early modern period in which Jews and Judaism can tolerate, to my mind, a wider array of variety of topics, a kind of total um, library that is different than the bifurcated or um, compartmentalized library of the modern period. Yeah, it seems to me that he stands as a great example for, I use the term cosmopolitan, but I, I, you used a better one, the, the ability to hold an eclecticism and a variety of interests, a respect for all the different addresses of those either authors or the in the reception theory kind of language, the people who read them and who want to read them and where others might be, have access to those uh, those libraries become in our time, uh, I'll just use the seminaries library as an example, and the collection out uh, in San Francisco and the Ziegler School in LA, we have certain libraries that in a certain sense mirror the cultural reality and then the great libraries of our own universities and university studies programs that have unique collections and especially now take on new authors collections as well. Their voice are parts now of the libraries around the country um, and around the globe. And that, that kind of gets me a bridge to your Footprints project. And before we take other questions and, and comments from, from folks, this is a project you co-direct. And can you tell us with whom are you co-directing it? And what is that quick project about? And how is it, uh, in, in do you think, is it influenced by Oppenheim? Is it influenced uh, in some way by your work as a Jewish historian of books and people of the book? Uh, where does where does that motivation come from? 
Sure, I'd love to talk about that. I'm going to do a quick screen share just to show you what we are talking about. Um, so this is, a, I'm hoping you can see, let's see, what, what can you see? <laughs> yeah, we see the footprints uh, okay. main page. Marvelous, marvelous. Okay, so, so what you can see there, this is the foot, as you tell me, you can see the footprints main page. This is a digital humanities project. And it's designed, or I'm doing it this with, um, with three wonderful colleagues, uh, Adam Shearer at the University of Pittsburgh, Marjorie Lehman at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and Michelle Chesner at Columbia University. And this is a, a way too ambitious project that we're having a, a lot of fun with. It's a, it's a digital project. And somebody asked the question, how many books from the Oppenheim collection have been digitized? The short answer to that is very, very few, very, very few. Um, if people want to, uh, want to be in touch with the Bodleian Library, they're happy to copy particular items for you, but it is a massive, massive undertaking that hasn't much been done. That said, the drive in our period is for manuscripts and books to be digitized for access. But my colleagues and I are concerned that as books are scanned and digitized, we lose something of their materiality. We lose their objectivity. And I mean that word deliberately, we, we lose the character of them as things, as objects. And so we've designed a project that is dedicated not to what is in the books, but to the way books move. We send out armies of researchers to different places and people are invited to, to join us in collaborating on this to produce, to research every single book that we can find that was printed in the first 250 to 300 years of print and explore all of their different peregrinations. We want to find every Jewish book copy out there, and we want to explore all of the copies that we can find as they move across the map. We're convinced that in so doing, we will learn something about individual books, we'll learn something about readership, because if a book is printed, we still don't know whether or not it was read or what its impact was. We think the more we can research how books move, the more we'll learn about how they were used. And we can also learn something about cultural transfer. We can explore books that are owned in Christian libraries, books that are owned in Jewish libraries, books that circulate widely, books that don't circulate widely, books that cross the Ashkenazic Sephardic divide, books that cross the European North African divide, books that make it to the new world, books that don't make it to the new world. And we're hoping that by treating books, not just as words, but as things, remembering that they belong on shelves, they get picked up and moved, they are sometimes accessible and sometimes not accessible, that we might gain a bigger history of ideas, not disembodied ideas, but ideas that are grounded in families, in men and women, in Jews and Christians, this whole world of, of materials. And, and certainly some of the examples that I shared with you today about Oppenheimer's collection undergird the assumptions in this uh, in this project as well. That's wonderful. Really happy. Wonderful. I'm happy to talk more about it. Take a look down at the chat. There are a few questions you got to. Uh, one that maybe mentions the Valmadonna Trust Library. And how does the collection compare? So I uh, this collection actually to my I if if I'm remembering correctly, the Oppenheim collection is smaller, I think, than the Valmadonna Trust. But part of the reason for that is um, the Valmadonna Trust collection includes books that were printed between Oppenheim's death in 1736 and the middle of the 20th century, in which many more books are collected. Um, Got it. it. Also, Got it. It, pardon? Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, How about other, are there other folks who want to, Make a comment. Ask Mark, please. Uh, Dr. Tepuski, thank you. I, I thought it was a, a, an incredible lecture, both orally and visually. So thank you for really a fascinating topic and, and exposition of the subject. Um, just to answer one of the questions in the chat room, just to advertise for your book, Benjamin Marcus asked whether you put this into book form, that you have a, you published a book by the same name, same name as the lecture. So I just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. I recently acquired it for my private collection. So um, on, on, on producing this and so that we can all read about it. Thank my you. question is, do you, I, I, if I recall correctly, um, Oppenheim's, uh, his poem that he wrote that you, you referenced early in your talk, referred in, in traditional terms to 
the, the spread of, of Torah, that, that that was one of his, his purposes. Um, do you have um, any qualms about whether the consolidation of books in his private collection actually furthered that agenda? Um, you know, today we have public libraries that, that offer people like the Bodleian Library offered you access and opportunity to view his collection. But in his time, he consolidated books from various sources into a private collection. Um, and I understand the private public nature was somewhat, um, was somewhat uh, blurred. Um, but do you think it, it actually advanced the, 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 the agenda of spreading Torah that all of these books, and there were many fewer in his time printed than obviously we have access to today, did it advance the, the agenda of spreading Torah in his time? Hmm. I'd like to think yes. I'd like to think yes, and here's why. I think because Oppenheim was an address, I think because he was a known quantity, he was something that people could find. He wasn't just an obscure holder of books and manuscripts in a hidden place, but rather had a kind of, the Latin word would be fama, had a reputation. It meant that people knew where to go to find books like this. I, I really do think of him as a kind of national Jewish library before his time, which meant that people knew where to go. There were really no such thing as, as Jewish libraries before this time. There were Batei Midrash, but a Beit Midrash had a very, very narrow range of the books that were in them. Oppenheim's collection is marked out specifically by the fact that he acquired so many books and that people then knew where they could go to get them. Um, and, and often this wasn't just uh, people coming to him. Because he was such a book man, Jews would often write to him for help with printing their own books. They would write to him for letters of endorsement for their books that would, that would spread the word. Um, sometimes a community of Krakow wrote to him in 1702 to say, we don't have enough, we don't have enough copies of a Masechet, of a tractate of the Talmud. Can you please send us some? And he arranged with the printers to send a cartload to him there. Um, sometimes he would pay uh, what a new copy of the tour, the compendium of, of, um, of Jewish law, code of Jewish law was printed in about 1699. He bought 50 copies. So he paid for it to be printed and also in exchange got 50 copies, which he then distributed widely. So I see him both as somebody who supported the production of the making of knowledge and also quite literally the dissemination of the objects of knowledge by, by spreading books out there. He didn't love sharing his own books. Um, you had to come to him to get them, but he also did help books move, keeping them in circulation as well. Should we grab some of these other questions along the side? Sure. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I would think question. it's interesting for our community to know what you're working on now. And if you want to invite people to the uh, Penn Advanced Jewish Studies uh, Center lectures you're giving, uh, I'll, I'll let you pitch it and, and, I'll re and I'll circulate that information as well. That's a center that uh, we're familiar with at Orzarua and enjoy the great scholarship and scholars who are associated with Great. So that, that does answer one of the questions was if he did not keep these books, can you tell what current, say, famous or significant works would be different? What borderline direct impact did this library have on Talmudic dialogue and literature? So this is just a, a spoiler for a talk that I'll be giving at the Cat Center um, in a short amount of time. I think it's I better get get writing on that. I think it's in the middle of March. Um, there are a number of different medieval commentaries on the Talmud that we have because manuscript editions of them were found in Oppenheim's collection and then brought to the printing press. Um, and I see a number of those as having moved into his collection also through really interesting Ashkenazic Sephardic collections. Manuscripts that he got from the land of Israel, which probably came in copy of copies of books that were produced during the Spanish exile, then made their way into Ashkenazic Central Europe where they were not part of the curriculum into Oppenheim's collection in manuscript and then were committed to print. In some ways, his eclectic Jewish library helped to de-bifurcate some of the medieval Spanish from medieval Ashkenazic strands of thought and bring them together on the printed duff, on the printed page of the Talmud or within the covers of the printed page of the Talmud. So the movement of people and as they bring books and manuscripts with them also alters, changes, helps us to see the Middle Ages in different ways 
and, and re-aggregates a disaggregated Ashkenazic and Sephardic culture. So that's, that's just one line of thinking about what impact this library had on Talmudic dialogue and literature. Um, somebody else asked a wonderful question about, are there any books that, that did not make it into his collection? I don't know if too many, but I do know that in, in a couple of years after his death, actually just a year after his death, somebody produced a catalog of books printed recently, not yet found in Oppenheim's collection. One of the interesting things is I think he built his collection based on bibliographies um, of his time, but in a short amount of time, the library itself became a source for writing new bibliographies. Bibliographers, both Jewish and Christian, would visit the library to look at books that they did not know of before to build these kind of platonic master list of books. And in, in some of these places, we have a list of books that are not yet in Oppenheim's collection. Um, one of them appears in uh, Johann Christoph Wolf, the great Christian bibliographer of Hebrew books, um, preserves a list of books not yet possessed by David Oppenheim in his otherwise very complete collection. Uh, so it, it's really a lovely, lovely question. Indeed, he was aware of some of the desiderata of his, of his collection as well. Um, and maybe in the very limited time that we have left, I'll, I'll, I'll answer with just a teaser to the question, what are you working on now? Does it relate to Oppenheim's books? In the process of writing uh, my story about Oppenheim, I, I noticed a moment where he's absent from the city of Prague. Oppenheim was often absent from Prague. In fact, his mail was regularly forwarded to him in Hanover, where the library was, rather than Prague, where he was chief rabbi. But on one particular occasion, he couldn't be found in Prague. And that was in the summer of 1713, when a massive plague epidemic broke out in the city. And Oppenheim did what lots of people do, who have the means to do that, which is he fled the city and sought refuge in a healthier, less cramped, less dirty, less unhealthy place in Vienna. And this fired my imagination. I discovered this about 10 years ago and had started collecting material. And I decided to take the focus away from Oppenheim and explore instead all of the people that he left behind. And I'm hard at work writing as fast as I can uh, a book reconstructing six months of an epidemic in the city of Prague from the late summer of 1713 to the winter of 1714. I promise, promise I started writing it before the, the spring of 2020. Um, the parallels are all too eerie, but I'm, I'm in the process of writing uh, a micro history of sorts about one Jewish, large Jewish community in the midst of an epidemic in a time before our own. Listen, the Shulchan Aruch says that you're to leave a city based on a Gemara that says, get out of town. So you, you, have, you have some debate uh, then that comes into focus, and I'm sure you can find wonderful, wonderful sources that would also uh, illuminate those decision-making processes and what people might have felt like uh, if they related to the library at all and the texts as guideposts in their lives. The fact that we have more and more texts of Oppenheim's collection to relate uh, to as guideposts for our lives is really now more in our focus than ever before since your award-winning book. And it's no doubt that it was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award or, or a, uh, one of, one of the, the, the great mentions there, so that more and more people would become familiar with what's now housed in the Bodleian Library, but also in your mind uh, as an example for us to, to think about the nature of our relationships to Jewish books, both the material books and the contents of all those we call Jewish. And we are so indebted to you for, for that great, great reminder and encouragement. And so we're gonna follow your work. Uh, we, we like to attach ourselves to people we think are doing wonderful, intellectual, curious work at Orzarua. I put in the, the, the chat, the link to the CAT Center at Penn. Copyists, collectors, and curators stocking the rabbinic bookshelf is on Thursday, March 10th. And on Wednesday, November 13th on, of 2019, there was already uh, a talk about uh, the plague, survival, and domestic material culture. So you were telling truth, telling truth that this started as an interest way before the opportunistic moment of the, the modern pandemic. Uh, but we are uh, really grateful you made it to us on Zoom. And one day, God willing, in person, 
will be able to learn together. We want to have you back and to learn from you more. Thank you for this incredible lecture. Yishar Koach, Mark, Yishar for uh, making the bridge between me and Dr. Tiplitsky. And thank you all for being here for this wonderful uh, occasion of this year's Lucy lecture. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for thank you. Thank you so much. Marvelous lecture. Thank you.